We're going to talk about that this morning. How do we do that? And there are three things I'd like to highlight. How we can be glorifying God through how we work and how we can see this happening, this dynamic process of bringing things under the Lordship of Christ. First of all, God is glorified in how you do your work. So the first thing you have to think about this morning is, how am I doing my work? And here what's very helpful is the story of Joseph and the story of Daniel. And these men were mightily used by God in a very dark, secular environment. Joseph in the kingdom of Egypt and Daniel in the kingdom of Babylon. They were used by the Lord in an amazing way. So let's go to Genesis 39. And I just want to read this because it's so beautiful. Talking about Joseph. Remember, he'd been sold by his brothers into slavery. And now he was in, he was in Potiphar's service. So now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of this Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. And the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. Did you get that? It wasn't just on Potiphar. The things he owned got blessed by God. The field, the cattle. The properties, everything got blessed. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. And now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am, and my master has withheld nothing from me except you. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Wow. I mean, you can do a whole hour on that. But think of this. Think of the way that it says God was with Joseph. I want to say to you, God is with you in your work. God is with you to bless you. To put his favor upon you. You are favored. You are blessed. Ephesians 1 says we have been blessed by all, with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As Christ's people we are. We live under his blessing. And so that blessing translates when, it, when you go to your workplace. It says the Lord, Lord is with Joseph and he prospered. Right? And, and, and it was, became evident to his boss. Can you imagine what would happen if, if God's purposes are so, God uses you in such a way, blesses you in such a way that your boss would take notice that their God is blessing you. I mean, he didn't know who God was. This is an Egyptian, a pagan guy. But he, somehow he looked at Joseph and he says, God's blessing this guy. Can you imagine what that would look like in your workplace when people begin to notice that God is blessing you? God is using you. And he was given more and more responsibility. But I want to highlight the end, the last part. He says, how would I sin against God? How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? It is important how you do your work. It's important. Integrity. Not defiling yourself with corruption. And I think that's one of the most difficult things today in any workplace. And I th- some places are harder than others, of course. But corruption is knocking on everyone's door. Cheating. Cutting corners. And he says, how can I sin against God in my work? Through my work. God has blessed me in my work. But how can I sin against him? We see the same principle with Daniel. Daniel had, was in a very similar situation. He was taken into exile. And so in Daniel 1, 
In verse 8, we read the following. When, he, when they were taken, these young men, into exile, they were given food to eat because they, they needed to show how strong they were. And they, the, the, the government wanted to place them in different responsibilities. But it says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Again, he chose not to conform to the pattern of this world. He said, I'm not going to eat what you eat. I'm not going to do what you do. The same way that Joseph said, I'm not going to sin against God. Daniel did exactly the same. I'm not going to defile myself. I'm going to keep myself holy before the Lord. And then it says in verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, these men, Daniel and his friends, looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Again, this principle that when you do what is right, when you, your heart is right before God and you do not defile yourself, God will place his favor on you and people will notice it. It will be noticeable how you are different from other people. And so this was evident by the way he does. And then it says in verse 17, so these four young men, God, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Guys, do you realize God gave them wisdom, not about the Bible, but about literature and learning of the culture they were in, a pagan culture, an evil culture. But God gave them the wisdom how to navigate, how to use that, how to be God's servant in that environment. Someone once said, you will have to learn how to swim in dirty water without drinking it. Because there's a lot of dirty water where you work. But God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. So supernaturally, he began to see things that no one else saw. Can you begin to trust God for that in your workplace? Because remember, later on, these visions and dreams had to do with the destiny of the kingdom. And it had to do with, the, with, with what God wanted to accomplish. It says there in verse 18, at, at the end of the times set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with him, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Oh, I want to shout about that. I get excited because think about this. These guys were witch, full of witchcraft. And all of a sudden, these four men who were servants of the Most High God were seen to be ten. Ten times more intelligent. Let me tell you, there's something that you and I can tap into that is better and higher and greater than the things of this world. And even the best thing that the enemy or the devil can bring you. And you can have wisdom and understanding that people will look at you and say, where does, is this coming from? And we're not talking here about church leadership and church administration and how to do the sound and stuff like that. This is their job. They were in government, and all of a sudden, they were 10 times more clever than all the other people that were in government. God gave them favor, and the king appointed them. And you know the rest of the story, how God used Daniel in a powerful way. And I read last week in chapter 6, when the other officials wanted to trap Daniel, they couldn't find any corruption in him. They, they went through all of his files. If he had a computer, they did a, a forensic audit. And what did they find? Zip. Nothing. Wow. Man, and these, I mean, we think sometimes we live in evil environments. These guys lived in very evil environments. There was not just, there were demonic forces at work, and yet they prospered. God used them. I want to share with you someone. This is a, a man I had the privilege of knowing. He passed away just very recently. A South African by the name of Graham Power. He is, was the CEO of the largest private construction company in South Africa, the Power Group, and later he became the chairman, the, 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 the chairman of the board, and, and, you, and, I, and I, you can go and watch his story on, on, on YouTube, you can, you can do a Google search on him and you can go and read, but how God, first of all, met Graham on a breakfast, a Saturday morning breakfast, men's breakfast. He was invited by a friend. He went there, and for the first time, he realized, oh, I need to give my life to the Lord. He, he wasn't saved. 
He gave his life to the Lord, but then the Lord began to speak to him. There are a lot of things. It's too long. I'm not going to go. God used him for a prayer movement that's now across the globe. But one of the key things God spoke to him about was his company and how he did his job. And there was a lot of stuff going on in his job and his industry that weren't godly. And he became a movement. It became a movement today that's called Unashamedly Ethical, where not only does he, his company, but the other service providers for the construction company that he works for are challenged to do their jobs in an ethical way. And they have a few points, paying fair wages, paying taxes, giving to charities. They have like these four or five points. And they ask businesses to sign up and to do things, do the work in a different way. Glorifying God through good values. And it was, it was tough for them in the beginning because he had to, can you imagine, you know, the first time he did this, he had all of his service providers in his year, a yearly function and they were in this big place where all of the, 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 the people that do the bricks and that bring the pipes and everything and he had them all together and he shared with them that he was going to take a stand against corruption. It took some guts. God used him to bring about a movement of doing business differently. Second way God wants to be glorified through your work is how lives are being touched through your workplace. There's a very interesting scripture in Genesis chapter 45, verse 8. And this is about Joseph. We just read about how he did his job in Potiphar's house, and then he got promoted. You all know the story. And at the end, he was put over the kingdom, and he was char in charge of, 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 of the grain and everything that. But it says very interestingly in verse 8, it says... When, he's, when he was talking to his brothers and, and they were reconciling because they'd sold him into sa sla slavery, he said, So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. I want to emphasize the words, he made me father of Pharaoh. What do you think that means? He became his physical father. Oh, I'm adopting you, Pharaoh. <laughs> no. It's a spiritual thing. I became his father. I became a guiding voice. Think about that. He was not Pharaoh. He was under Pharaoh. But God used him to have an influence over Pharaoh like a father would over a son. Think about the influence God can give you. It doesn't matter what position you are in. But God can give you influence in people's lives and over people's lives and you can affect their destiny by the way that you do your job and the favor God gives you and you can give advice and you can give insight where it is needed. In Acts chapter 18, I talked about this last week, speaking about these, this man and woman, Priscilla and Aquila, that were with the apostle Paul in his ministry. In Acts 18 verse 1 to 4, it says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So I want you, I want you to see this, that this is a little bit different. So, so we see in Joseph ministering in his workplace, he became the father, like the father of, of, by his own declaration, the father of Pharaoh. But here you have a man, Paul, who partners with a husband and wife. They set up a business in Corinth, but the business became the excuse for preaching the gospel in that city. So for them to be able to make an impact in Corinth, Paul said, I'm not just going to go as a missionary and preach on the streets. He saw the strategic value of starting a business in Corinth. And we were there a couple of years ago, and they explained to us that at that time, Corinth was such an important city that they had a, an Olympic Games that was more important than Olympic Games at Athens. And there were people from all over the world that would come and watch the Olympic Games. And so Paul knew this was a strategic city, but it, he also knew that if the people were going to come from all over the world, they would need to stay somewhere. And if the hotels are full and the inns are full, he would have tents. And so they were tent makers. And so they would provide housing, portable housing for the people that came. So it was strategic for them to have their business in Corinth and not in another city. And they could then use that opportunity for the people who came from all over the world to preach the gospel. 
So think about how God wants to use your job wherever God sends you. Remember what Joseph said. Joseph said, you didn't send me here. God sent me here. These guys said, these people were, were ordered to leave Rome. And so they ended up in Corinth because they were, by the king's decree, they were moved. So they were like refugees, right? But God used where they went to bring them to a place of business so they can affect change in that city. So think about how God wants to use you in your job, wherever God sends you around the world. Those of you who have the privilege of being sent as missionaries by your job. You're not just being sent there to do a job for your government or for a business or for your company. God sends you there for his purpose. It's about discovering that, that there are people that God is waiting for for you to get there so you can touch them with his love and with his grace. So don't you just see your job wherever you're going, you know, as, uh, as well, you know, where is God, where is my government sending me now? Oh, where is my business now sending me? No, no, no. Look for where God, how God wants to use you there. There are people there waiting for you to arrive so you could preach the gospel to them. Someone once told me when God saves you, he already has other people in mind. He wants to use you to touch them. And the third one I'd like to highlight is that God is glorified when you bring godly solutions to your industry, to the way that you do job, your job. And in Genesis 41, we see how God uses Joseph to bring a solution to his industry. To his, there was a problem. There was a famine. Remember the story? The, kingdom, the king had this dream about the seven cows that were fat and the seven cows that were thin and the, and the, and the grain, seven grains of wheat that were fat was fat and the seven grains of wheat that were thin. And, and Joseph gave the solution. God gave him the revelation. And not only did he ga- give him this, the interpretation, but God told him exactly what to do in that situation. And so... Let's go there to Genesis 41. It's very, very insightful how the Lord used him, right? And so, so they had the dream. You can go read it. So verse 25, he, he tells them the interpretation, the seven years, the famine, the seven. And then verse 30, 28, he said, It is just as, as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance, but seven years of famine will follow them. And then all the abundance of Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. And so... It says there in verse 33, And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance, and they should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. And so Pharaoh asked, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. A problem. God gave his servant the solution, not just for the kingdom, but for the world. And so God is glorified when he begins to use you to bring godly solutions to the workplace that you are in. There might be challenges that no one knows how to fix, but God wants to show you how to fix. God wants to give you wisdom and understanding so that you're able to do it. I want to tell you briefly the story of Michael Brown. He's a, and that's the name of his company, Michael's Transportation in a city called Vallejo in, in, in California. He, in his transportation industry, God led him on how to give creative transportation solutions to the school districts. And he began to get a lot of contracts. But then he realized that there was a problem between the owners. He was the owner of the business and all of the shareholders and the employees. And God gave him a solution on how to bring the wealth that was in the hands of the few into the hands of the many. And they began a process of handing over the business to the employees for them to become shareholders. It's an amazing thing. But they had a challenge. And instead of these employees asking for raises all of the time, they began to take part in owning the business, a solution no one had thought of. 
And it's becoming a model for other businesses in the area of how he has done this. God gave it to his servant, Michael. And this expands to the community. Remember that God didn't only use Joseph for the kingdom, but for the world, the community. People benefited from the solution. There's a school in San Jose, a school, group of schools called Valley Christian Schools. God gave them one of the, the challenges they had was how do we bring educational solutions to the non-privileged people in our city and in our district. And God gave them a solution that, that wealthier schools or more schools that had a lot more resources would partner with a, with a poorer school and they would partner to bring education solutions. Creative stuff. And there are so many of those that you can go and, and search for on the internet. But I want to say to you, God wants to use you to bring solutions that would never be possible otherwise. And I want to end with this. In, in, in these things, that God, if God wants to bring solutions to your industry, it's important that you have a burden, first of all. And secondly, that you would take that burden to God in prayer. If you go read the story of Nehemiah, it's amazing. You know, this guy was the cupbearer of the king. Again, a man in exile. He wasn't an important guy. He was just serving the wine to the king. But when he heard that his city's walls were broken and the, the gates were burned, he went into mourning. He began to pray. He says, God, give me favor with the king. And the next moment, he's before the king, and the, and the king is, why are you, your face so sad? And he says, how can I be glad when my, when my city's walls are broken? And the king asks him this question, what do you want? Supernaturally, God used a cupbearer to rebuild the walls of a city paid by the king in which service he was. But because he had a burden, and that burden took him to God in prayer. Same happened to Esther when her people were in danger of being exterminated. She asked the ladies and the, the virgin girls to fast with her for three days, and God gave her favor with the king, who was an ungodly king, and the, and, the, and the nation was saved, but she had to have that burden. I want to say to you this morning, my brother and sister, the things in your workplace need to become more important to you with regards to your prayer life. This, the, the things that are wrong, whether it in, is in your workplace or in your industry or in your nation, need to weigh so heavily upon your heart that you cannot do anything else but cry out to God. And the moment you do that, God is, it's like God is looking for the person through which to bring the solution. But he wants that person to be fervently burdened so that God can say, I'm going to use you because you have a burden for this. You don't, and it's not like you're looking for glory or anything. You, you just want to bring a solution to a problem maybe that no one else is seeing. And, and when you pray and you intercede, God will open doors for you and God will give you favor. And the resources will come from a place that you never imagined. And God will use you to bring a solution. And so God wants to use you through the way you do your work. God wants to use you through the people that he wants you to touch. That's his purpose. And thirdly, God wants you to bring solutions to your industry, but that will even touch a city and will touch a nation. But it's all about the burden. It's all about if it really matters to you. If you couldn't care less and you say, well, you know, I hope things change. I mean, maybe someday it will. You won't see it. But if you really become burdened, God will move stuff around and work supernaturally for you to be used of him. And guess what? It will happen as it happened with them. They will see that God is with you. See, it's not your responsibility. Oh, God is with me. No, no. You just follow the steps. Fix the way you do things if you, if you need fixing. Secondly, begin to pray for the people in your area that you need to touch. There are people that you need to speak to. I, I, when Richard Blackaby was here, he talked about, as about this guy who was going to work, and he was saying, God, how can I minister? I'm not allowed to speak about Jesus. And then he saw someone at lunchtime. He went to sit with the guy, and he said, how are you doing? And the guy says, I'm going through a divorce. He ended up going with the guy to his house. And he did counseling and he helped the husband and wife reconcile. He said, I never knew God could use me like that. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a pastor. But it's about being sensitive that God's spirit is with you. God is with you where you are in your workplace. So I'd like to, we'd like to pray with you again this morning. Last week we did that. We'd like to do that again. 
Those of you who say, God, use me. God, use me in my workplace like never before. Would you be willing to stand up just where you are? And we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that the Lord would use you like never before in your workplace, through your workplace, in your job, through your job, that God would, God would give you supernatural wisdom and understanding.